Uh, just in case, if you don't mind, uh, let's start five, mi five minutes late so that we can wait for someone who may need more time to come in. <clears throat> so, uh, it's time to start. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the tutorial. So, uh, interpreting and explaining deep neural networks, a uh, perspective on time series data analysis. So, my name is Jessic Choi, and uh, I'm an associate professor of Graduate School of AI at KAIST, and I'm a director of Explainable AI Center in Korea. So this will be our agenda. Of the tutorial. So we will have a three section of each of 50 minutes. So I will try to give you a brief overview of explainable AI. And uh, also after that, I will give you the basic uh, algorithm to find the input contribution of individual pixel or features in the deep neural network. And that will be the first part of our tutorial. And then I will go to introduce some of the recent methods to interpreting inside of deep neural network. So in a way that we will try to find the internal mechanism of deep neural network and the recent advance. And I will try to explain uh, several explainable uh, model for time series data analysis. So it will introduce basic uh, concept like motif and uh, we'll try to introduce uh, uh, how we can analyze deep neural network for time series data. 
And then I will explain Bayesian method to explain those models. Uh, 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 although our section will have 50 minute and a 10 minute break, so uh, I'd like to have a more flexible schedule. So if you have a more question, then the, we can extend some of section. And because we have uh, one hour of buffer, so, so this section will have four hours and uh, our section is scheduled for three hours. So we can have a Q&A in between and also after the section. So please ask any question uh, during the tutorial. So this is actually what uh, people think about the uh, improve uh, the contribution of AI. So so uh, prepared by McKinsey. So in 2025, the automation of knowledge work may reach up to 6.3 uh, 7 trillion US dollar. So that is a count of 51 percent of US wage or 2.7 trillion dollar wage. And if you go to some of the sections, so then. Then you can say that so currently data collection and the data processing and the predictive physical work can be uh, substituted by AI algorithm up to 64% and 69%, 81%, and so on. So let's see some of the examples. And this is the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005. And you can see that most of these uh, autonomous driving vehicle uh, may not succeed the uh, path. But but in 10 years, so, so way more made by Google can uh, commercialize those autonomous vehicles. So we don't have any doubt yes. that these technologies must be enough. So it may have uh, about 10 years to change from the 2005 uh, Diaper Grand Challenge to this, this challenge. Testing it in New York City streets every single day until after more than a month. And uh, you can see that, so like that is actually the change after 10 years from 2005 to 2015, 16. And you can also see some of the change in semantic segmentation from 2015 to 2017. So, so this is a semantic segmentation from the image to the uh, pixel level label. You can see that uh, there are some good uh, prediction, but in the road and the tree and so on, but you can see that those quality is not really great in 2015. And And if you go to the video that made by uh, SenseTime and Chinese University of Hong Kong, so the pyramid is in person network in 2017 and improved performance a lot. So you could see that there are a lot of significant improvement uh, to predict the pixel level label of the car around the, like a scene around the car. Uh, but uh, some, some like, of course, actually, like this AI system is great to change our life. And uh, there, there are big hope and that will be useful for our real, real world application. But we can say that those AI systems, we may not understand AI system enough. So many complex AI systems are not transparent to see the mechanism inside, as an example. So the Uber's first car accident, that's of Ellen, and the, the like uh, Uber doesn't have a good um, protocol at the time, how like a safety driver should drive when there is actually not good enough uh, light around. And so like uh, the Uber safe driver may like was watching a TV show called Hulu 
And we may not in this, uh, like understand the in internal mechanism much of complex AI system. And also there is actually like a famous uh, the system called Compass, which predict the prediction of the crime. So like in this case, in this specific case, actually there, there are the two people who is called the Dylan. So who is called the Dylan and who is called the Bernard? And uh, Dylan is arrest because one attempt to burglary, and the uh, Bernard is arrest because of one resisting uh, arrest without any violence. And the compass system is AI system who predict the uh, follow up crime of the specific person, and the uh, compass predict that the Dylan may have low risk of the crime and uh, the risk of three. And the compass system predict Bernard may have a risk of high risk as 10. So afterward, and the Dylan may have another like a three crime, like three drug position. And the Bernard don't have any um, the crime afterward. So then like how we can, what is, what is the issue in here? So what is the problem? So can you expect so how we can um, correct those uh, issues in the compass system. So of course, there's actually bias. So this bias, like AI algorithm are supposed to have data bias and the model bias and algorithmic bias or selection bias in this case, probably the compass system may have data bias, which has more like a criminal who is African-American data. So that like, uh, so in this case, so, so we like AI, so we should find which kind of bias and the problem in AI system has is what we have to do to find actually the cor correct the AI system. So this is important for like a many uh, commercialized system because EU enact the GDPR called the General Data Protection Regulation. So one of those actually article is right to explanation. So data subject has the right uh, to meaningful information about the logic in verb when the a client uh, requests and how the decision, decision is automatically made it. And the EU administration is when violated, not only for this article, but other like uh, uh, articles. And the 4% of global revenue will be fined. So that is enacted in about two years ago in 2018. So like that is important. So to find the clarity or transparency of a complex AI system is important, not only for this actually like a regulation, but uh, this sector transparency is important for many mission critical systems. So like uh, I will try to say the mission critical system is any system who has a lot of impact for our life and the money and also the military. So if you go to healthcare and also big financial industry and also military service and uh, when we make a wrong decision, we may have a lot of hazard and also we lost a lot of money and the causality, a causality and the life. So in this case, so even if actually AI system looks good, we may not use this AI system because there is some danger. So we may lose some of very important asset. So like a uh, DARPA is uh, the fund, like uh, had been a uh, important funding agency for AI researcher and uh, like uh, also military agency like uh, decide that. So, so like AI system or AI funding or AI research can be categorized into three one. The one is actually the describe like handcraft knowledge, like a logical system. And then so the like AI system evolve as a statistical machine learning. So it's categorized the class from cat and dog. And then the AI system should evolve to the explainable system, which can adapt contextually with a few data. So as an example, so a young boy is holding a baseball bat in here. 
So then we should find why these uh, two proceeds is uh, classified as a baseball bat. And that is actually what we may need to, may wish to learn. And if actually the panda image come and there is a target like a distortion, and when the target label change to given, then the, we actually need to know why this is happening. So that will be the topic that we'll handle in the second section. And also, uh, of course, we will not directly like uh, handle this, but we will indirectly handle this in terms of uh, fundamental theory. And also, then the, when the like AI agent learn from the like uh, screwed training data, skewed training data, something like it learned did nothing wrong, and we should actually know how we can adapt this like uh, system better. So like uh, explainable AI has a lot of questions like this. So previously, like without explainable AI model, we have a training data and the machine learning process as written in here. And we have a learned function and uh, we may not know why did you do that? Why not something else? And when do you succeed? When do you fail? And when can I trust? How do I correct an error? So this is actually a very hard system for many AI systems, but with explainable AIs. So we may need to have a new machine learning procedure and we may need to have an explainable model. And we may need to have an explainable interface. Then we can understand why this decision is made and the why not this decision is made and the why this will be succeed or fail and how we can trust and so on. So there is actually like a, a something that people say that there is a trade-off between the accuracy and the explainability. And uh, like, uh, of course, explainable AI is big field. So we can say that there is some part which will explain the internal decision of deep neural network, which is the focus of our tutorial today. And also, like, uh, there are a lot of other explainable machine learning models. So inherently, those models is transparent than the other model. So in this case, so when some of model was explainable, and those other previously was not really great in terms of accuracy. So explainable AI is to improve the performance of those models. Also, the improved explainability of those models, which is already good enough, something like the neural network. And uh, also some methods like uh, each, like uh, so some of the method is more the agnostic method when Whenever the model come, which is like we wish to make an explainable AI, which we can apply those uh, uh, algorithm to whatever model come. So something like, uh, yeah. So we call the model induction. So these are the focus of our, our tutorial. So like uh, oh, we will go for internal attribution, like input attribution, the first part, and the internal representation, second part, and the time series data, third part, and the regarding like a deep neural network of we will try to go on the input attribution to the internal mechanism and to the time series analysis. So like, uh, let's go to the first section. So like input attribution method for deep neural network. So please ask any question, so if you have any. So this is the, uh, the basic slide for the input attribution method. So what we typically do is, so we have a machine learning model from the input image. And we have a black box classifier, so AI algorithm. And this is our classification. So there's a garden snake. snake. Can you see the garden snake uh, in the right hand side part in here? 
So suppose that the Garten snake is predicted. Then the input attribution method will bring the input and also the classifier and the final output and try to uh, find the contribution of individual method, individual pixel or input in terms of this black box classifier and the final output. So that is actually the input attribution method have. So if you see this uh, figure, then the data part which is more highlighted with the red color, it uh, are the where the input, the important input feature are located. So that is actually the goal of the input attribution method. So like uh, we can define input attribution value so like this. So the so model is n dimensional one. So we have x is input and we have n-dimensional real value from x1 to xn. And we have also a c-dimensional output for the class. So we have a class from 1 to c, so that we will call sc. And this subscript is, uh, the, which like we will denote a specific class that we have. And on attribution value, or we also call the relevance or contribution of each input feature for a class C. So we have uh, entry, like a residual relevance of C, and for individual input is represented by uh, attribution of input to the specific class C. So we will have an example from the linear model in the next slide. So let's go for the linear regression model. So we have a y is w0 plus w1x. And also we have until the wnx plus epsilon. So we have uh, n dimensional input and we have a linear output. Suppose that we have an example for the future capital asset uh, we call that yc. And uh, we have uh, two investment x1 and x2. So like a future capital asset in terms of expect, expected value is represented by 5% of increase from the first investment asset and the 50% increase in the second asset, right? So like a we, if we have uh, invest money in the first one, we will have a 5% increase. And if we invest for the second one, we have a 50% of increase. So we can also compute the influence of individual variable as this one, right? The coefficient of this one. So in fact, this coefficient can be uh, represented by the model gradient. So what we are saying is, so if we take the partial derivative of the investment, uh, like with regard to the future capital asset, then we will get the Rix meaning that uh, if we make a partial derivative of x1, we have 0, 1.05, and if we have a partial derivative of x2, One five zero, right? So, like this is actually the first attribution that we can define. So, in terms of here, so we just take partial derivative and there is a contribution of the first input, and we take that as the uh, relevant score. And uh, the like, uh, so influence of the independent variable of the target can be represented here, but we may have two different inputs. So, this is the case. So, the like, a uh, so this attribution is uh, good enough when we assuming that the input value for x1 and x2 are well normalized, meaning that we have x1 and x2 has the same mean and variance, and there is a random variable and the normalized well, then the, we can use just uh, the partial derivative as influence of those uh, individual like uh, input. But in many cases, so we may have different like a scale or value of x1 and x2. 
suppose that uh, like even if we can get more like uh, investment revenue from the X1 and X2, so we may have a constraint, the maximum amount of money that we can put into the X2. So that we only uh, like invest on 10,000 US dollar, X2, and instead we uh, invest more money to the X1, like 100,000. So in this case, the contribution of individual input x1 and x2 can be represented as like 1.05 times 100 years dollar and 1.50 and times like uh, 10,000 years dollar. Then we can say that the first contribution, the contribution of first input is about like eight times bigger than the contribution of the second one. So in here, so like, of course, the partial derivative is same. So like uh, whatever we amount change in X1 and uh, will be uh, 1.05. And uh, those change will be 1.5. But the thing is because of the like investment the money that we put in X1 and X2 has a different scale about 10 times more, the contribution of X1 is about eight times more than the second one. So in this case, we compute the attribution as a gradient multiplied by element-wise input. So we have input and gradient. So what I'm saying is actually like, uh, so we may have several ways to compute the like uh, define the attribution but depends on the application of the scenario. So either we define the attribution as a partial derivative when the value is well normalized. And when the value is well, not well normalized, we use input times the gradient of those partial derivative as our uh, the relevance or uh, attribution and the contribution of individual pixel. So that is actually like a straightforward when linear model comes, right? how much we change input and how much the output will be changed, right? So like uh, there are three properties that we can have when the good, uh, like for the good attribution method. One is explanation continuity. So uh, on, it, on input, uh, on attribution method satisfy explanation continuity when uh, given a continuous uh, prediction function is Cx, so it produces continuous attribution Rcx. So the thing is, when output is continuous, then the attribution is also continuous, right? So that is for two nearly identical data points, the model response are really identical because both of them are continuous, right? So there is no big jump or no distinction between the two closed points and so on. So this is actually explanation or like a continue explanation continuity. So another important one, uh, one is implementation invariance. Of course, this is very hard to achieve. So suppose that we have uh, model one and model two, two functional equivalent model, and for any data x, so the model produces the same output. So then the, in this sense, so whatever we change data input X in here, so even if the mod two model have a different implementation, so this will provide an identical output. So on input attribution method is implementation invariance. And if it always produce identical attribution for M1 and M2. So meaning that, so for example, I suppose that X1 is uh, represented as XG boost. So X1 and 1 is XG boost. Suppose that X2 is the neural network. Then the, we have an attribution method which we can apply to the XC boost and also to the DNN. And the, the attribution that we compute from the XC boost 
and the DNN are always identical for any input, any class. So any input come, and any class come, so the attribution that we compute is identical when those output are same. So that is only possible for the model agnostic method. We typically like to say the model induction. So, but uh, this is actually hard to <laughs> achieve. But anyway, so in many cases, actually, like if we can make a partial derivative exactly for any model, M1 and M2, then the, we may achieve this one. So because the partial derivative, like we may have a way to compute the partial derivative, meaning that we can compute the uh, contribution of individual input um, so that so if it is a case that we may achieve this, but in general, it is very hard to achieve. So another important property, so probably the most important property is the sensitivity N. <clears throat> So an input attribution method satisfies sensitivity n when sum of the attribution for any subset of n feature is equal to the variation of the output s cause removing the feature. So, so let's focus on this part a little bit. So we have xs, xs is a set. So this set has n element. So we have x, so original input data, and we have x, s. And we have n variable, and these are x, set minus x, Yes. So, like, uh, what we can say is this is the final outcome. So, and we also mean that we can plug in the partial input to the um, our classifier. So, this is a classification value when we plug in x input original x to the classifier, and this is a value when we partially plug in the input only the remaining part. And then if we can compute the individual contribution of input, so of x, so even if we have x, we can compute the individual contribution of feature from one to n in xs then the summation of individual contribution in x, x, s is identical to the difference of the classification output that we plug in all the input and minus the classification output with the partial input. So, I will try to make a illustration a little bit easier. So suppose that we have x s and x sem minus x x s. So we have classification of classification of weed. We use all the variable minus the classification output. We only use the remaining part and is summation of our one classification output x plus or n classification output x. So we can compute the contribution of individual input in here. So we call that as contribution of individual input r, i, and x for the classification output c. 
So we add all of these contributions that we compute. And because we compute all of these, and then that is just subtraction of the output that we compute from the O minus the output that we compute without X. So in a way that the output can be decomposed, the gap of output can be decomposed into the individual summation of contribution that we made, right? So like when N is capital P capital N, then the, we call that as the efficiency property uh, in the Shapley value. So like meaning that, so like uh, this is actually the, we call the base point. So in a way that if we plug in this X bar, then the output of XC, X becomes zero. So in some cases, actually the X bar may not be become zero. So then we should find those base points, right? So like, uh, so suppose that we have a dim neural network classifier. So if we plug in all zero in the input value, and after we normalize, probably the output may not be zero, right? So then we should find, uh, sometime we should find the X bar, which is the base point, which start our classification becomes zero. And then we increase those values from some value. So then we can have uh, like a positive classification output from them. So then we call that as a base value. So in a way that, so we actually, the base value is trivial, so it becomes zero. Then the, we can say that, so those when the capital N come, so individual contribution, so we can factorize the final outcome of X set can be the like a decompose in the individual summation of R, right? So yeah. like if we draw the figure again, then if we have X and we have all the value in here, And if we have R1, X2, R, N, X become at C, all the value. Right, we plug in all the value and the uh, individual, we compute the individual contribution of individual input and that are equal. So then if it is a case, then we call that the input attribution is good enough to find the contribution of the individual input ex exactly. And uh, that can be like a uh, decompose of the individual input. So we call that there is a sensitivity N. So this sensitivity N is very important theoretical property for the attribution method. So the like uh, attribution method, so we compute attribution in many cases. So in, in some cases, so our goal is try to satisfy the three property that we uh, explained before. And uh, like uh, some cases we wish to have like a uh, find approximate uh, the value to have this attribution. So as we discussed, so the typical method that we use is get partial derivative and the use attribution or input times partial derivative as attribution. And uh, we also typically use uh, sensitivity analysis, which is absolute value of partial derivative. And uh, we also use gradient input for nonlinear model. So that as we say, like I explained here, so we have gradient of the value of outcome in terms of individual input and times input. So if we actually like have an example for this, uh, the deep neural network case, and we have feed for the neural network, and then so we have our grasshopper is also the predicted somehow, and the carton snake is also predicted somehow. Green lizard is predicted somehow. Lockbibo is predict predicted somehow. Then 
So if we decide that our, like, we will compute attribution for the class, the garden snake, C, in here, the C is garden snake, then we uh, ignore, eliminate all the other class C and the attribution method, and we only focus on the garden snake and try to compute the attribution backward, right? So if you can, if you see that, the contribution of this part become change, right? Because we select the cartoon snake and then if we propagate and compute, then the, we can see that those area is good enough to compute the contribution of garden snake. So there are some methods that we will handle here. So one of the methods that uh, we introduced will be Epsilon LRP. And the uh, LRP stands for the relevance, the layer-wise relevance propagation. So like, like uh, this layer-wise relevance propagation is another way to compute the gradient in the neural network in a dynamic programming way. So this is relatively uh, the, um, efficient, computationally efficient, even though it will compute the similar like uh, uh, outcome with the other method. Uh, so like I will explain. So the suppose that RIL is relevance of unit I of layer L. So the, the new concept in here is, so we we'll try to compute the relevance of internal layer. So previously we only focused on the contribution of input but in here, so we are uh, computing the relevance of unit I of layer L. So isolated unit in the layer L. So the relevance of target neuron C is activation of the neuron. And also the, we compute the ZIJ, uh, the weighted activation on a neuron I onto neuron J. So what we are saying is if we have L minus one, so we can say it's L, uh, we we have layer and L plus one. We have node I. We have node J. W I J, and we call that as this is X I. And the Z X I J is this term. So G I Z I J is X L X I in the Lth layer times W I J from L to L plus one layer. So like contribution of the input in I node in the previous layer to the output in the J node. So of course, actually the outcome in the J layer is a summation of all of those contributions from the old input in the previous layer, right? So we call that as like a attribution. So we define the attribution in the final layer as if a unit I is a target unit, C. So if I is become C, meaning S, C, X. So I will write S, I equals C, X. Then the, we call that the value will be the relevance value in the final layer for i. So only c will become non-zero value. And then, so in the previous layer, and the like a relevance of the previous layer can be computed as this way, as a formula, and that will uh, give us a rel relevance score in the input value. So in the input value, the final attribution is represented as this value in the once layer in the ith value. So in input x and the contribution of ith feature is represented as this. So like uh, the equation is relatively simple uh, to understand. Suppose we have a ladybug here and <clears throat> So we define those in here. So we define activation as A instead of X. 
So if we have node i here and node j here, then so we can say that so the z i j is computed as the multiplication of these two part is z z i j. And the final outcome for the lab debug is 1.756. And this relevance will be propagate uh, to back um, into this formation. So if we have i's relevant to the j's relevance, so we are sum of all the contribution, all contribution, to J from or node in layer L. And this is the contribution from I to J, right? So this is a ratio of contribution that I made compared to the older node in the previous layer L. So then we uh, multiply it actually like we compute this. And of course the contribution I is also to compute so I like a node I in L can contribute many uh, nodes in the next layer. Summation of these contribution is sum, then that will be the contribution of I in the layer, layer L. So like uh, we can uh, like uh, use chain rule along with a single path to pro produce the partial derivative. So uh, like uh, do like um, uh, the, our goal is to compute the partial derivative. That is our goal because the partial derivative will give us the correct attribution value even if we have the neural network. So like uh, for, if we have any two unit, so what we can say is, so this is xj and this is xi, then so we have a wi, so actually like, so this like subscript is a little bit changed, but anyway, so we can say that this is ji is a little bit changed from i to j, and then I will say that just ij wij times so our nonlinear uh, activation function so which we call that as so this is g j and xj is f prime no f z i I will try to write again. So we have Z activation. F J W I J and here we have X J. Right? So if we try to compute partial derivative. Then we will have W I J times F prime. Right. So, so this is from the equation, right? So like if we have a complex network and C C and if we have Xi then what we can do is we can multiply the weight through all the paths that we have and we can uh, compute the gradient oh z oh yeah so 
Oh uh, yeah, so good question. Uh, there is actually like a Yeah, so, so you can say that Yeah, so pre-activated node. Clear. So, like a very the continuity from Xi to the node Xc class, then we will define those as a G. So, G. So, partial derivative in terms of G. So, when we say that G is function of F prime. So, like, a, suppose that we compute, like, we already know the form of the part derivative of activation function we have F. And we call that as a G. And what we can do is we can multiply those activation function, those weight that we have over the path, and multiplication of those activation function, then we can compute the partial derivative. So this does work for fully connected one and the convolutional one and the recurrent layer. So without multiplicative node and the pulling operation and so on. So like in reality in LRP, so like uh, if we have a max pooling, then we should change max pooling into the average pooling. So because actually pooling is not directly like applicable here, but like uh, we are assuming that, so we our node like model, so if, like if we change those max pooling is compared to the like, so we start in here. So when the pooling operation is not used, and the fully connected and the convolutional layer and the non-linear unities are only used in here. So in terms of theoretical analysis, so the first proposition that we can make is, so epsilon LRP is equivalent to the feature-wise product of input and the modified partial derivative that we defined in the previous one, the multiplication of all the weight that we have in the individual paths and the times are uh, the activation function and uh, like a derivative of activation function. And we here, so we like a call those G is G LRP and uh, Fi GI divided by GI is a ratio between the output and the input at each nonlinearity unit. So like, um, yeah. So the in ReLU or hyperbolic tangent and uh, this G LRP rule, is average gradient of nonlinearity unit from zero to Z. Suppose that we have Z here, and uh, suppose we have F Z here. So if we have um, the hyperbolic tangent, and ReLU, right? So then we can compute gradient of hyperbolic tangent and the ReLU and the average gradient of nonlinearity by dividing those like a F, like a value that we have divided by Z value that we have. So we call that as G LRP value, so that we will use, as in here, it's the LRP value that we will use is, 
So the GRP is average gradient of nonlinearity in here. So then we will define GRP, especially in the value as FG values, the value that we can get in the value that we have pre-activated value Z value divided by the pre-activated value Z that we use with GRP. So in the value value, value case, so if it is positive, we'll use one. And if it is negative, then we'll use zero. So let's try to prove. So the yeah. So this this is what we will try to prove. So the LRP is equivalent to the picture product of input and the modified partial derivative. So what we are saying is, if you compute those, uh, if you propagate the LRP LRP value, then the, we'll compute the gradient times input. Right. That is what we wish to show. So we show um, so proof by induction. So in here, so subscript is a little bit changed. So like uh, I'm sorry for that. So this is the next layer, and this is the previous layer. So by definition, the epsilon LRP of the target neuron um, uh, Yeah, so good question. So in epsilon LRP, so in the sharp corner, we may not have derivative. So in LRP, actually the epsilon LRP has some approximation to prevent those is happening. So the epsilon value will be added to the right-hand side and the left-hand side based on those signs. So when those signs become zero, then probably we should actually put into the either like a zero value or the one value we may need to design based on the rule. So then, so epsilon LRP relevance on the like a top layer. So this is in the layer L, top layer, and layer C. So we decide that. So this will only take the output of the class C. So out of all the class, we will get only the Cartan thing, right? So that is actually the value that we will get. So there is a relevance score, and the relevance score is, so if we actually like a look back how we can get the relevance score. So this is activation function, and this is actually the one that we have for the Z, C layer L, right? So in the last layer, pre-activated value Z as DC is, what we can say is summation of all the contribution of previous layer, times xj on the uh, like uh, the value in the previous layer times weighted value plus bias right so we use this uh, definition in the previous slide so the uh, next slide so the relevance part of layer so in here relevance part of like uh, the parent layer can be written as So this is the relevance part, relevance rule. So if we have final layer L, in the previous layer L minus one, then, so we will compute the contribution of this is C, right? And what we, we are interested in is we wish to compute those J R J L minus one, right? So what we wish to do is, so we wish to like uh, make a correct, we wish to show that. So the LRP rule that we compute in the equation formula in the LRP may satisfy the condition for the partial derivative of this of in terms of output, right? So we apply LRP rule so the LRP rule is the relevance of the final layer times 
the contribution of individual output, right? So this is the contribution of all the like a uh, node in the previous layer L minus one, and the contribution of the node J in the L minus one, right? So then, so we can say that so this L C L based on the definition that we have in the previous one. So L C L is the uh, this is a preactivated value. right and the activation function right so this is the definition of the final layer right and then we say this like as it is and um so now so we have um so we can say that this is by definition of grlp so we can say that this is gcl and so this is what we can say is f z c l divided by z c l so you can see that this part is z c l right Right, so then by definition, this is G L R P and Z C L. Right, so then we substitute that as G L R P and the Z C L and times this value, right? And uh, like by definition of this gradient that we say, so the partial derivative in terms of GLRP, so output XC, input XJ, is multiplication of all the weight along the path times GLRP that we compute along the path, right? So this is the GLRP along the path and this is the weight along the path, right? So this is a WP and uh, this is a G, G, P. And we can say that this part is the GRRP puzzle that to mean that the so all the paths we multiply W and the activation function times input, right? So then we can say that uh, this like rule will be satisfied in the final layer. So if we go to the if we go to the next layer, so for the inductive step from the hypothesis that on the layer L, uh, the RRP explanation, then we can assuming that the X R I L is satisfied. This is partial derivative in terms of GLRP times input. And uh, we can say like uh, then the layer L minus one. So this is what we apply the rule, the LRP rule. And this is the value in the previous layer. And this is the LRP rule that we put. And so like uh, we assuming that inductive hypothesis, then the, this value is satisfied and the XIL is coming up and we can say that this part become uh, the, like we can say this part become so GLRP XI, so like, so we can say that GIL is written as this form, right? And uh, we can put that as this, uh, yeah, so, oh yeah, so like what we have to put it, so instead of this value, we can substitute this value, right? F 
of this Z I L N Z I L, right? So then we can put that as G L R P and X I L. So that is like by definition of F D by by Z, right? We put that as G L R P and the times the weight and also X value. So we can say that, so for individual X, I, L, I nodes, we can compute those X, I, and the derivative will be like derivative in terms of we say G will be multiplied and also pass from I to J will be computed. And we already compute those LRP on the I, we compute those into J, J, from the node J, right? So for the old node I, so we have a lot of J here. No, J, so we have I. And we will sum out this into W, I, J, right? And the compute with the GLRP and the GLRP, and also we compute the partial derivative times GLRP and WIJ, we sum over, over the possible value, and we'll get those by definition of all the paths will be computed with input will be computed. So in a way that, so then we can compute the LRP and the inductive step. So we can say that when the ReLU is used or hyperbolic tangent is used, and we can compute the input attribution times input, like gradient and the times input will be uh, like computed. So the thing is, so this LRP rule is, LRP rule looks uh, very simple, but and intuitive. But actually this rule will compute the gradient exactly under some condition and the time input. So, but in reality, so in many cases, actually those LRP rule will not compute the gradient well because of the base input. So meaning that, so even if we put X, I, zero, then it will not zero always. So we should somehow find find these base input in a way that so we can compute so how much we get far from the x because we have and S I so our input from change from X bar to X and our output change from zero to the our final outcome right so we should somehow find X bar when x0 is not zero, right? So like uh, in that sense, actually those base input are like a finding and find it and apply t to actually this rule. So we call that as a deep lift. So like uh, this, uh, uh, we can also show that. So I will like omit the proof. And the epsilon LRP is equivalent to the gradient and input, only value are used as a nonlinear function and also deep lift if applied to a network with no additive bias with nonlinear function for f such that f0 is zero so as we say so like meaning that the epsilon LRP may not work so when f0 and zero is work and also we have another implementation for the invariant method so that like as we say it's called the integrate gradient uh, so that LRP and the deep lift, assuming that, so 
So it's instant gradient by using average gradient and it's nonlinear to function. So that does not necessarily result to in average gradient of the function as a whole. So then what actually the method called the integrate gradient is, so using the function, so we have a baseline input x bar and we have the uh, input that we wish to have x. And the partial derivative of the value x bar is computed and they integrate it. And the those actually like a uh, uh, computation is integrate. So you can say in the way, so what we can say is, so we have a value xi and the, those value xi, like a contribution of those xi is computed from the base input to the value that we change. So individual like contribution of why we change that we got will be integrated out and those integrated out will be multiplied with input, right? So what I'm saying is, so those value is not actually computed, but we are like uh, computing the, like um, how can the marginal contribution of when we exchange from the base input to the value x, right? So what we can say is, from x bar to x, so those marginal contribution is computed and integrated out, right? And the times xi. So like, uh, so because of this computation, we can say that so how much x changed a little bit, then we know that how much the x, like uh, x, the contribution x uh, changed. So it's in, in, in this way. So this actually the uh, integrated gradient satisfy the property that we say sensitivity n. So meaning that this is one of the most accurate attribution method, right? So in terms of it allow the like uh, decomposition of the input in terms of final outcome. So we can compare the attribution method into the, so this is a bit delay. And uh, like a comparison of input attribution method as a sensitivity or analysis, just take the absolute value and the gradient times input and the absolute LRP and the deep lift and uh, like an integrate gradient. And as we say, the integrate gradient satisfies sensitivity and property, which is good. And uh, if you apply those comparison with a different method and uh, like a disease gradient input and uh, like integrated gradient and the deep lift and the epsilon LRP, you can see the epsilon LRP has some error and the deep lift also has some error. And another like uh, improvement method that we can use is uh, the, the perturbation method. So what we typically have is, so like we compute the gradient and uh, use those input times gradient as a black box, like uh, the final outcome. What we have is instead of take the gradient, we put a mark and this mark. And uh, so suppose that we have a garden snake and uh, finding the SCX. And then in here, so we put those gray area part and plug in the, the output and those output will be computed as SCX. Oh, <laughs> uh, so it depends on, so but in the previous slide, it looks like the integrated gradient looks a little bit better than the other, like um, me. But probably you, like um, may people, people may have different, so I will also explain so another one which have different like a value. So like a, so our human eye may have different bias. I will explain a little bit like a recent method that 
uh, use this. So, like, uh, so if we plug, like, uh, apply those occlusion, then the, we can compute the output change. So, if we put those boxes around the garden snake, then the score for the garden snake change a lot, drop a lot, right? So then we can compute that. We can indirectly know that how much this individual box will contribute, right? So in a way that, so we can make occlusion by one by one pixel and five by five pixel and the 10 by 10 pixel for bigger. Fifteen by fifteen pixel, right? So then we can say that. So if we put the uh, like a mark and the randomly put those mark and the C, so we don't have we, we may have a randomly put mark or individual grid cell may have a mark, and we can like uh, change the location. And uh, if we actually put the uh, occlusion ten by ten, then we can identify this area is the area which has highest change in terms of final outcome, right? So then this is a result of perturbation method. And uh, like, uh, so like what I'm saying is some people may say that uh, like applying the <laughs> rule is a little bit complicated. I wish to have simple method. And uh, one, uh, what I can say is you can just use a simple method. Then the, like uh, this occlusion will be like a, uh, uh, apply then the computing the difference and uh, this will give us like a relatively simple but powerful attribution computation right and uh, there are a lot of methods like uh, regarding these like uh, LRP gradient input and uh, gradient back propagation deep lift and so on so I say that deep lift has finding the base point which is somehow important and uh, what, one of the important issues that we may need to handle is the negative relevance. So like if you use all relu and then the, except for the final outcome, then of course actually we can also relu to the final outcome. But like uh, we, what we typically do is in the last layer, we may not use the final outcome, like on uh, the final outcome, relu, relu. So then, so in a specific like a node, Z, I, L, plus one and one so on so plus one and then we have actually like a positive contribution and also a negative contribution in many cases actually people only computing the positive relevance or actually not use negative contribution much right but the thing is so even if this is like a location for the dog so many of the relevance that we propagate the positive one and the many of the relevance that we propagate to the negative one overlap, meaning that, so what we focus on is we wish to get a location for dog, then this is positive, negative. That is our hypothesis. But in reality, if we apply that into the deep neural network in many cases, the positive one located in the dog and the negative one located in the dog. So there is not really like a easy problem to solve. So what people do is people use many tricks. So like, uh, so, so this is a forward path. So we use value. When the negative value come, then we will eliminate, right? That is what value do. And the gradient based method. And uh, when we have the like a negative contribution, so we will not so like uh, we have, so we, like uh, we, when we propagate our relevance, then when the negative node comes that we previously deactivated because of the negative outcome, then we will eliminate, right? And the decomponent is not only for the, like a uh, forward path that we remember, then the whenever negative attribution come, ne negative attribution is computed then it will eliminate. Guided back is so we eliminate the previously activated negative one and the negative contribution that we activated. So in a way that it will propagate the so only the positive contribution that in the forward path and the positive the, uh, relevance in the backward path. Like there are many like a method in the gradient and the component and guided backprop. 
But in terms of noise actual handling and the issue that we have, so this method does not solve clearly like what like uh, clearly the issue. So one of the like uh, solutions. So of course this is a biased method. This is not really theoretical yet, and the biased method that like uh, I uh, collaborate with um, uh, my colleague, and which is called the relative attributing propagation. So one thing is. So like uh, whenever we have a negative contribution and a positive contribution in the final layer, then the, we compute that it, like a negative contribution and the positive contribution, we take absolute value. So even if we have strong negative one and we have a positive one, and we have a positive one and positive one. So the like idea behind the one is, so in many cases, negative contribution also like uh, locally, like uh, emphasize the location, the in the important object located. And another idea is, so in many cases, so like a positive one and the negative one should be balanced somehow. So we apply something like batch normalization, like uh, and then we call the uniform shifting in the propagation procedure. Suppose that many cases in the positive value, right? Of course, actually, because we have a positive one in the final layer. And when we compute this relevance, and uh, like some like because we normalize, which is below the, the contribution below the like uh, mean uh, average, we make this intentionally negative one. And also the like a negative one becomes strongly negative one, right? So this is biased method, like as we do in the like a uh, batch normalization. Uh, so we are in, intentionally make this actual contribution to the zero, so positive and negative one. And uh, so if you apply this method, then the, like uh, you can see that of course actually input gradient is close to the like a uh, not input gradient. Integrate gradient is close to the optimal in a way that where the deep neural network located. So if you see the Dalmatian. And uh, you will say that this Dalmatian like a feature are highlighted and also probably in the background, like a Dalmatian may be like a co-located with the grass. And uh, this part is not really strong. Now only if we locally see this part and the negative contribution is computed. So that is actually like uh, what we can say. In the mini bus case too, so the part in the front is not really strongly correlated with the minibus, but the other colors and the road part and the other color is located the minibus, right? And the syslog, so you can see that this part is not really syslog, but the like bottom part, probably syslog is captured like around the, the bottom of the sea, so probably this is the case. And then we can see that, so this integrated gradient show what the neural network see, but because of the human bias, that we, what we wish to have is only the like uh, object that we have are located and object that we locate, object that we found are located. So of course this RAP is a biased method that we put our human bias, like uh, we try to extract the human bias but like uh, this RAP image is much like uh, natural to what we are looking for. So what we what I'm saying is like of course we have a lot of variant for the LRP and the pattern recognition guided vector and so on. But in many cases, so, so positive and negative contribution is not really well uh, computed. But like uh, this RAP, even though we put uh, the bias, then close to what we actually like wish to get. So if we compute that into the like outside inside ratio box and the semantic segmentation mask, then you can see that RAP is so much like a better than the other method. And when we like do the negative perturbation, meaning that there is object 
and the part of part in the negative one and the RIP is strongly like uh, uh, like statistically significant like very significant to robust to the negative noise right so what I'm saying is so like probably like what we used to get like a semantic segmentation mask like one is probably a little bit different what the neural network find to like uh, improve the performance in the uh, classification but like in terms of visualization so we may like prefer to have a bias like like a uh, uh, uniform shifting that we call in the RAP. Yeah so this is actually the conclusion of the part one so uh, I spent more time than expected and then like the like a input attribution method can compute the contribution of individual input and under some assumption result of different input attribution methods are equivalent and handling negative attribution are also important and uh, there is actual contribution conclusion of part one and these are reference for one so um so i will stop the section one here and I will try to start in the section two in about 15 minutes at um, 2.40. Yeah, 2.40. Yeah, so actually those <laughs> Second section is also very interesting to see how we can analyze the inside of the neural network. So, so please stay tuned. <laughs>
Oh, yep. So So we use more time. We go second section and the first section. So uh, pro probably like uh, this section may yeah. So I will try to. So so in here, so I will introduce some recent advances in interpreting inside of the neural network. So which we had network this section and again this section. And also the um, Lagrangian multiplier, like a convex optimization method, and uh, like a, a example-based sampling method. So, like, uh, let's try to see the visualization for interpretation. Suppose that this is uh, like a VGG network. So, what we wish to see is we have individual node. And when like uh, input come, then the, we wish to see that like uh, which unit is activated uh, at the beginning. So like uh, suppose that the unit one is activated when this image come. And the uh, unit four is activated when this image come. So top activated image in the like on top and the top activated image on the bottom. So, so what we are interested in is like so. By the way, what like a uni one whenever like which image or feature activate uni one. So like interpretation for the uni one is a lamp, and the uh, interpretation of uni two like four is car, for example. So like a score in here. So case is probably like a so in the like a. Uh, lamp case is higher and the car case is lower because there are some cases which is not car and the um, bird is detected, right? So what we can do is we can like uh, test this with semantic segmentation. So suppose that we have an individual image which has a semantic segmentation label and we can put label and the uh, highlighted, highlighted mask, meaning that the individual node, I will explain this later. So, and the individual node has highlighted region and we have uh, like a highlighted activation, like a, a semantic segmentation label. So what we can say is based on the semantic segmentation label. So when this is part is highlighted, we can see that which label is the located like uh, overlap more, right? So this is computed by intersection over union. So based on the label for the lamp is located how much portion of this lamp will be overlap with highlighted mask. So sometimes lamp will go up and down something like this and out of all the area and we'll compute the overlap area so that is a mean intersection of union the intersection of union so that is a score so zero point point like a one two so network dissection is uh like a discipline method from the alexnet in this case convolution one to the convolution five to like uh, find which feature are identified from the level one to the level two. So when actually the researcher in the MIT um, uh, group, in an MIT group and the find, so in the layer one, so most of one is color or texture will be like uh, identified. And but like uh, in the second layer, the color and the texture, the 11 texture and the part can be uh, activate like uh, identify. In the next layer, the more object is identified. In the next layer, so in the more object like road and skyscraper is identified. And then the, in the fifth layer, you can see the water and grass and the more scene 
and the more part and the more texture will be like highlighted. So as an example, so if you see that, so like the way this is possible is, so this is the uh, semantic segmentation uh, model. So meaning that, so we have convolutional neural network, but uh, suppose we have oh, 256, 256, and the spatial resolution of internal layer will be maintained, right? And these are channel, and these are channel, and the finally, to so these channels inside of the neural network, because this wish to get a semantic segmentation label. So when we try to dissect, dissect the individual layer part, even though this is smaller, 50 by 50, the spatial resolution is maintained. So where the highlighted part will get the highlighted object with what we used to get, right? So then highlighted part will give us the highlighted activation part, right? So in a way that, so in the highlighted part, will be evaluate, compare with other semantic segmentation mask, then like a, where the highlighted part has like high correlation or high, not correlation, actually like correlation, which is computed from the intersection of union. And when those uh, part is highlighted more, then we can say that, then the, these are, just a moment. Yeah, so highlighted part uh, will like uh, have the label. So if it is a case, then, uh, we can say the convolution, like AlexNet case, like comp 5 unit 75 and the car object and intersection of union is 0 0.13 and this car is located and sometimes the like a wheel and so on. And the comp 5 unit 1.7, then the road is activated. So the, the fifth layer, 75, like 79 unit and 107 unit, and uh, we locate it individual object. And if you go to the unit 104, this is a mountain. And then case, if you see that mountain with uh, like a green color. And uh, if you go to unit 200, this is also mountain, but with ice will be located. So then this can be also the applied to the like a many different like a unit and, and like a network and the different unit and different class. For example, in the house case and the, like a resident 5C unit, 5C layer, unit 1410 will locate it, this type of object, the house. And the uh, LNet, so 4E layer and the 789 will locate this type of house. And the train case too, right? And train case, inception net and so on. So sometime actually though, when we say the train, so this will get train rail, not train. So if you go to a plane, the airplane, and the smaller plane and so on, right? So like a larger plane. So like what we can see is although like a many uh, layer or unit is uh, not clear to see, but in many cases, actually the like a sum of the like a node is clearly identified as if we may think actually some of the neuron in our brain may account for recognize some of the object like dog or part of car or the plane or train rail and so on. So we may have a specific neural unit in our brain, probably, and we can identify those channel and the unit in the neural network. So in this like way, so compute the mean intersection of union, right? So like not all the unit is clearly identified, but so many of the unit can be visualized and identified and so on. So then we can understand, especially in the semantic segmentation case, 
extent we can identify individual unit, the role of individual unit. So this method is also can be applicable for the generative model. Like a generative model is a little bit like a, a, a different perspective. So in the semantic segmentation, convolution neural network, so we used to recognize, right? But in the generative model, we used to generate. So like uh, which neural network will generate the term, say, height? So which neural network will generate the image like object for the church and so on, right? So the, like, uh, the way we make this uh, possible is we find, so this is a typical generative model, right? So after adversarial training is going on, Yeah, so after adversarial training is going on, and uh, what we can do is we can make a semantic segmentation of the output. And we, so for example, in the tree case, this is the image part where the tree is, right? And uh, as we do in the previously, so many uh, internal layer of generative model, then this has a spatial resolution is maintained, right? So say 50 by 50 uh, example, and we dissect uh, one of the layer, we call that as a single unit U, and see how U is activated. So suppose that those U is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is eight by eight, the layer. So then we have highlighted the region, right? and up sample to match the image size, say 256, 256, right? And then when the up sample highlighted part is overlap with segment, segmented part, and the, this intersection of union is good, like big enough, when you can say that the unit U is generating trees, right? So we can find in this way, so when we have a semantic segmentation like a model, and we can also like this, uh, the future map, future map can be upsampled and computed by mean intersection of union. So like based on this, so we can find the church sample, and if you train the church sample, the generative image, so in a specific layer, the so unit 119 will generate tree. And the unit 32 will generate dome. And uh, if we train the dining room sample, and the unit 139 will generate window, and the unit 65 will generate table. Right? So we can see that. So like uh, whenever unit 139 is activated, the location will be filled with window. And uh, with unit 65 is like uh, activated, the location will be um, activated with the table and so on, right? But somehow in some cases, actually like uh, those, uh, like uh, image is not well generated as seen in here, you can see the part, right? And then researcher for the this like end section. So try to find the, which feature are like activated this part. And they found that the unit 63 is generating this type of image. And the unit 231 seems similar one. Then the, what they said is actually that like uh, the researcher in here turned off. This unit 63 and 231, and the image is actually like now uh, become more natural image because the artifact which is not less uh, generated one is actually eliminated. So in a way that so we can uh, find that so some of the unit in the network dissection we can see that so which neural network capture the specific object and which 
like a generative model generates specific image and object and so on, right? So like also we can find those units to crack the image and so on. So let's try to go for a more like a fundamental like a detail the theory of regarding this one. So like uh, people say this is a neural network verification and the robust deep neural learning. And uh, like what we are doing is, so this actually is a very challenging problem because we have linear like a uh, mapping and also we have non-linear mapping. So most of the space that we have in the original space, suppose that we have sample in here and we have two axes and we put plus some value, minus some value, right? Along the axis, right? And uh, this actual region will put it and with nonlinear function. So these like from the part will be non-convex and highly non-convex in the multidimensional space, right? And suppose that, so our goal is, so these are the area whether the class C is happening and uh, suppose that this is area where class C prime is happening. So our goal is, so from the specific point, specific point, so in the original space, we are perturbing the input and we wish to see how this input will change, right? But this computation is hard because we have highly non-convex ones. So we introduce one method, try to wrap this up with convex methods, convex like a polytope, and another method to like uh, explain the internal one, like uh, why this non-convex shape is untapped. So like a non-convex make the problem MP hard. So in like principle, like to verify this is MP hard, right? So our goal is try to find the convex superset of the one which we source make this tight of the original like a non-convex space in a way that the originally like uh, this is good case and bad case and only this part is bad. And uh, we, if we have convex superset, and this part become error, right? We more we have more error, but we wish to reduce this error, right? So that is actually what we wish to do. Yeah. So non-convex set has no error near south, and so but we have error. So that is what we wish to make this like a tight and uh, so on. And uh, actually, like, I will introduce one of the methods like uh, made by uh, DeepMind, which won the best paper award in UAI in 2018. And uh, one idea is try to like uh, run this uh, like convex superset of the original non-convex one with uh, the optimization problem with Lagrangian multiplier. Lagrangian multiplier. So what we have is input and perturbate it, and uh, this is bound. And uh, if we have a naive bound, so we have a lot of error, right? A lot of error. But because we have a tight bound, so error is reduced, right? So then we wish to have a tight bound. So like uh, this is a simple like a uh, mathematical uh, notation, but we try to minimize those uh, complex com complexity. So I will omit the uh, like proof. And uh, like just follow the notation. So X input is the input to the neural network. And the uh, ZL is pre-activation of neuron at layer L. And uh, X is a vector of the neural activation after application of activation to ZAL. So like as we see in the previous section, F, But notation is a little bit changed in terms of L. Probably there is a linear summation, right? And so on. And the H is activation function instead of F. 
and uh, we have a, a, a upper bound and the lower bound. So upper bound and the lower bound of X. So like we can change this into the verification problem. So we have a nominal input, X nominal input, and the uh, S in in the nominal input is constrained in subset as we see here. And S output is constrained on the output that we wish to like verify, like something like this, whether S out. So like X in for or X in in this region. So we wish to check whether we apply. Uh, so like did I say? Oh uh, yes, yeah. so XL is a vector of a neural activation, and Oh, did I? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't say this one. Uh, this one is activation at S layer, right? Activation in S layer. Yeah. So, like, what we wish to check is so if we put all the input in. Uh, so this is actually the map x l x in when x in is coming from s in right so then we wish to check these are all less than s out so what we can like a uh, present is so assumption in this paper is S out is presented in the final set of linear constraint, like so. S out is the end of linear constraint in a way that when we put uh, XL, so XL times CI plus DI is always uh, less than or equal to zero. Right, so we put all the X in here, so then XL should be. That is why we the linear coefficient C and D they should be less than or equal to zero. So, <coughs> so what we wish to solve is so we wish to put all the x like uh, in S1 in the input space and we wish to find the maximum value of C T X when we put C I for individual C and these maximum value then like to check whether this maximum value with plus of d is actually like uh, the violate the condition actually the plus d is violating the condition so individual one right this is actually our problem to verify so if you formulate this problem in the primal form then our one is so we wish to maximize like uh, the one when we have zero to zero L, Z, L, X, and X, L. So from the input to the individual layer, so what we try, try to put is we put C and X and the time C, so we have a concern of this amount. And so this wish to be, we wish to find the maximum and the checking whether this maximum value is less than zero. And we also have a nonlinear constraint for the individual layer. So as we say, Z, L, N, H, and X, L plus one, right? And we also have a linear layer model. So from this X to Z, we have a W, X, plus b right and this is constraint for the input right so then so this is a primal optimization problem so we find the maximum value when we have constraint for z0 to zl so we have many nodes inside and many nodes inside in zero x0 and xl and the individual x and h like x and z has nonlinear constraint and the individual G and X has a linear layer model. So we already assuming that the W and B and are given, 
right? So given the linear model is like uh, satisfied, we have a constraint and we have a constraint uh, in the constraint, we define the um, maximum value in terms of final layer output X, right? XL is decomposed into the like uh, representation of ZL and the ZL is representative of XL minus one, ZL minus one, and the XL minus two and so on until the input, right? So input also has a constraint from the range, from the norm to the individual input from the plus delta X to the plus delta minus delta X and so on, right? This is our primary problem. And what this actually people do is compute like this, like that change that into the uh, Lagrangian multiplier form. So like a dual form. So what we have is original maximization problem, but linear linear layer constraint is represent these so input individual layer, so linear constraint with Lagrangian multiplier. So we may have L Lagrangian multiplier for mu, and so we also have a nonlinear constraint. Nonlinear constraint is also changed into the Lagrangian multiplier and the lambda. And this, like a dual form, is uh, exactly the same optimization with Lagrangian multiplier is represented, and only the like a uh, bounding box and upper bound and lower bound is introduced, and all the equations are getting inside of optimization problem. So actually, like uh, the what this actually uh, like uh, people do is like for any like a uh, lambda and mu the objective function in the dual form and uh, the objective is the upper bound on the optimal value of the primary form and the optimal value of dual form is also the upper bound like so what thing that is the optimal value of the dual form is also the upper bound and in the dual form the convex optimization problem in terms of mu and uh, lambda. So like uh, the dual form can be uh, like computed with subgradient because that, that is a convex optimization in terms of two parameters so that the optimal like problem like a primal form can be the, like uh, solved by the dual form with this one, right? So like uh, when they apply so in the like uh, um, synthetic data and the MNIST synthetic data. So this is actually the attack which uh, verified how much the error come around the corner of the form when actually the uh, error is founded. And when they compare with the existing algorithm and this LP approximation algorithm found the better of upper bound than the existing method. These are one, with the proposed one, these are one, the existing one. Yeah, so that is great in terms of theory, but like also then good that, so like uh, we can find the local part, but somehow like a uh, still, so what we are saying is, like uh, this method is not good enough yet because, so suppose this is a decision boundary, right? And they assuming that these actually the gap, the artificial gap, and the compute how much actually like uh, this uh, model will violate the condition. So meaning that so it will detect how much this is close to the like a decision boundary or generative boundary, but probably like uh, this may not be good enough to analyze what's inside of the neural network. So that is actually the one motivation that we will present in like uh, the paper that I like uh, uh, wrote with my student. So that we call that as, um, so like uh, suppose that, so like uh, in a convolutional neural network case, it is not solved yet, but what we can do in the, uh, we, we can do in the generative model. So we have a generative model. So we wish to have uh, like microscope like uh, the model. So, uh, so we call the generative boundary of our sampling. So like uh, this is a generative model and what we should have, so what we define is generative boundary in the generative model because 
like a model generation is also like based on the big uh, like a hypothesis space and the generative boundary. So when so we have this generative boundary, that generative boundary, we may have different like a node come from, right? And uh, one of the like what previous method has is so we have epsilon boundary of the query sample, but when we have different shape of generative boundary, so we may have different outcome generated from this. So of course, actually like this is challenging problem because typically the like this space is big. So say 4,000 input to the 8,000 like convolution. So we need that we have 4,000 dimensional space and we may need to divide that into the 8,000 dimensional like a uh, hyperplane, linear hyperplane. So then in many cases, we have too many actually like um, uh, slice of the hyperplane and also the hyperplane, actually the space that we are handling is too big. So like uh, the motivation of this is general to process is good, even though we have like a good theoretical understanding for to compute the upper bound by IP approximation and uh, like a uh, uh, like, um, uh, Lagrangian multiplier and also like a network dissection, gen generative dissection. So we wish to have more concrete understanding what's inside if this like a uh, network model. So we wish to make uh, example-based generation in a specific node and a specific hyperplane. So if you have one image in the data set, so we need to find the image which is generated in the uh, neighbor by considering the generative boundary. And if we have celebrated the image data, then the, we wish to have the image which is actually generated in the like uh, around. So as we discussed, there is a network dissection and the GAN dissection and the Lagrangian multiplier and the Google Deep Dreaming. But uh, like uh, if we have a naive bound, then the, that we may have failed to the, like uh, it's not robust. So, and also this does not like consider the actual boundary, right? So it consider the like a uh, tight bound, which is convex. So then it cannot be exact. So like to, so to introduce, so we will define a uh, generator as a GZ, a uh, generated image from G, and a hidden node as HL, a uh, neural representation of S layer, and the partial generation that we call partial generation, generation from layer I to J, right? Layer one to four is from G to layer one to four and also layer five to layer L. So this is the first layer, right? And we call that as G as a partial generation from layer I to layer J, right? And we can divide that into this. So suppose that we have H4 and that is actually 16 by 16, 512. And we can define generative boundary. So a value of HL is determined by the linear hyperplane in the space of previous layer, right? And uh, we call that stacking of this layer for the input to make highly nonlinear, non convex shape. And so we want to see this feasible region. And we train to put this discriminator in generative model. So those like a discriminated layer is what trained in the generative model. So in the L minus one to L layer in the HL, so what we can say is, so this boundary will uh, determine a specific node HL, either positive or negative and so on. So specific point in the generative region is defined by the hyperplane, which will determine the same size or same size of a specific hyperplane. And we can also like a generative region. So in the layer L of space SL, which is surrounded by a set of generative boundary. So as in here, 
So in the input space, a set of the equivalent class of Z with regard to the space SL, and the image space, so set of equivalent class of image with regard to SL. So especially we are interested in this part, right? Equivalent set of class of image. So given an image, so we used to have equivalent set of a class of image, which is surrounded by the same generative boundary, right? And uh, for example, if we have a generative boundary here, this is part A, this is part B, then so we know that this is the generative boundary like a slot. And when we go for this direction, this become the minus sign. And this become this direction, this is positive sign, right? So then we can distinguish this is based on the sign, right? Right. So then our problem in here is, so is there any question? So I cannot see the chatting. So it does come. So can you see the slide? Yeah. So we, we can define uh, the problem as this. So explorative sampling in generative region. So given a generative model G, and target layer L and the input query, query Z0, then the, we wish to find the set of equivalent class of image generated from the same generative region. So like the same generative region is defined by the same sign of the layer, in the same sign of node in the layer, right? So then we used to have this image and generate the image it's in the same generative region, right? So this is very challenging. So like a dimension is like huge. So a latent space of a lot of hyperplane hard to handle in practice. Like so in Pichigan, the first layer is like a mapping from the 512 space to the 8,000 space. And typical generated region is non-convex as you see in the previous like a uh, paper. And the uh, people use small epsilon bound sampling. So from the query, query and uh, finding the region, and uh, this is actually either the like uh, L1 or L2, and find the small epsilon based sampling, like uh, every sample inside the region exists in one, either small epsilon based sampling and the large epsilon based sampling. So, in the small one, so this will not be care, in the larger one, this will not be care, right? So, then there is an issue. So like what we serve in here is, so like we like uh, unpack the generative region as it is on convex and the changing that into the robot planning problem. So then the like uh, using the solution which is previously used in the robot planning. So like uh, searching the sample in the non-convex space and uh, we are searching, exploratively searching the space and uh, in the robot planning, so such a path, search a path uh, from the starting position to the goal position. While doing this, then they can like uh, fill the space from the non-convex region. And uh, it is high dimensional space and high degree of freedom. And uh, so we reduced the problem into the robot planning problem and uh, like, uh, and uh, used the RRT algorithm, which is successful in the robot planning. So actually we didn't like, uh, actually change that into the robot planning problem, but we use RRT algorithm. So RRT algorithm means work as this. So from the starting position, generate any sample and try to connect the, suppose this is tree, and the, from the tree, so we find actually the, for the sample, so find the smallest distance one, and uh, like uh, when this does not violate and uh, like uh, explore the tree. So suppose we have like this sample is generated. This is a tree. 
and when a new sample is generated here, and so boundary is like this, and so then we like uh, find the closest sample in the tree and uh, grow the tree for the direction in the unit length until we don't reach to the boundary, right? Constraint, right? So if while doing this, then we can fill the space. We start from the point and we can fill the space. And actually, the RRT algorithm is actually uh, uh, complete under some condition in a way that it can fill the older space uh, when we have enough time. And if we have a good hyperparameter to tune. And then, so we use this one. And also, like in many cases, so we have too many, like a uh, generative boundary. So in that case, so if we have 8,000, node in the next layer in the pigeon and the pigeon and it's too many so what we are trying to do is we to use like a smaller number of uh, nodes so meaning that so we disregard the node when the node is not uh, really important right so we only care the important one try to approximate of course we don't have to use this but in many cases actually if you use all the nodes and the generate sample inside is all the same image, like looks like exactly the same image. So the thing is, we wish to get the important like a hyperplane and the generative boundary and select those. And uh, you like visualize with the different setting and how the generative model change. So we use veronally mask optimization. So like we try to like a relax boundary, but maintain the output by using veronally like a prior and try to learn those prior for individual mask. And we also use Erwin regularizer for the mask. And um, so based on this, so if you use entire boundary, so we have too many ones. So if we have 10%, and we also maintain uh, the space, but the generative image is not change a lot. And if you use only 5%, and also the image also like maintain the shape. So this is algorithm. So like uh, we found the parallel mask optimization and then use RRT algorithm to generate image. So this is an image generated from the Curry, and uh, we like uh, draw the tree in each of different direction, the so blue and the orange and the green color. So if we go to the blue, and uh, if we grow into the uh, orange one, and uh, if we grow to the like uh, green one, so in different direction, and uh, we can see the different image. So can you see that what uh, specific difference in the green one? So different characteristic of green one and the orange and the blue. So can you see that there is small window in the green one? So the in the even though the like image are very similar, so we can see that the small window is made it in the like a church image in the green one. And also in the orange one, the background is a little bit more reddish and the orange color than the other. And if you go to the like a blue one, then you can see that the background color is a little bit gray, right? Not reddish. So we can see that inside. So of course, actually, we uh, select some of the important generative boundary, and then we can see like, explorative search the internal uh, like uh, uh, generative region. So if we apply this into the MNIST data set, and we can see that the MNIST actually five, image five, is actually much close to the epsilon base sampling. And also the like uh, architecture data set, and we can also see the variation on the generative model, but we can see that those uh, compared to the original image, it will change a lot. It's a real, like uh, the epsilon base sampling change a lot. And we can like uh, use different query and the different like uh, method, like a different uh, image. Then we can see that the 
our method can maintain the structure well than the epsilon based one when they research the same volume. And the PG GAN and the celebrity image and so on. Uh, one, one more important thing is so, like, uh, uh, when we change the ratio of the generative boundary, so we can see the variation how much actually the image is generating. So, like, what I'm saying is suppose that this is the original uh, generative region, and suppose this is the region that we have, like, say, 10% more than 10%, less than 10%, and, and less than 5% of general television. So we are interested in which image are generated in this boundary, A, B, C. So we analyze A, B, C. Of course, after B, C include, B include A, and C include A and B. So we can see that uh, if we have a more like a uh, generative region, then the original image are maintained more. So of course there are some variation, right? And if we use less than 10%, the image are more generated a little bit differently, right? You can see that the gender will be changed. Right, darker, different shape. And if you have used more, then the, the image is more changed, right? So we can see that which image are close to the original image than before, right? So from this to this, right? So like this part, like uh, we see that there are recent advances to analyze internal mechanism of deep neural network. And uh, like some deep neural network models such as semantic segmentation and the generative model make us to uh, analyze internal node better. And um, so we can possible to, like we can verify the correctness of individual decision generative boundary well than before. So this is a reference. And uh, let's um, have 10 minute break again and uh, let's see um, 2.40. So by the way, is there any question? Then if there's no question, then let's see and 2.40. Ah, 3, 3, 3, 3, 40, right? 1, 1, 2.40, right?
Ah, uh, hi, Jaegun Lee. So, uh, yeah, I will try to write in the chatting room. So it means that once the model is trained, the general uh, last section of our tutorial. So, <laughs> so this is early morning in Korea. So we uh, start from uh, 5 a.m. and now we have uh, 7:40. So the old sun actually come out, and also like uh, thanks for uh, attending the long uh, tutorial. So I hope. Uh, yes, yeah, so I really appreciate your time. So, uh, so like I hope that so the final section will be also useful for you and me. So let's go on. So in the final section, so we'll try to get into the uh, question. So on time series data analysis. So like how we can apply those methods, the visualization method in the time series data. So then, so like, for example, oh yeah, so the, like this part of video is not recorded yet, so sorry. So we will like upload this video after this section and we'll like a uh, request to the uh, production team that this will be uploaded soon. Also, I will like we will request to update the slide that we update in the like official site. Okay, thanks for asking. Yeah, so these are questions actually like from the Imon Kyo. So like uh, thankfully the Imon. Uh, like uh, send his slide to me and uh, refer like uh, using this for like uh, for tutorial. So there are many questions for the time series data mining and also the machine learning. So how we ever seen, have you ever seen a pattern that looks like, just like this? Or are there any repeated pattern in my data? And uh, what are the three most unusual day in the three months like a uh, long data set? And uh, so let's we go for the individual question. And uh, this is actually the definition of a motif. So find the subsequence having very high similarity to each other. So we call that as one motif, which is close to the other motif. So if we have a data set from one and the red one, if we the data set another like a blue one, then we can find the mapping. And if we assuming that this trend is similar, then it will be useful to like uh, predict the future, right? And uh, this like motif is actually used for many like a previous like uh, experiment. And uh, for example, in the B, the hopper, and when the sensor is attached, and when the this B hopper and uh, eating the hopper and eating the like a feed and uh, like um, uh, this different pattern of eating will be like uh, successfully uh, captured by the motif. So more motif revealed from feeding pattern or bit leaf hopper. And uh, when data set is an hour or long of like a uh, eye movement data set, and the sample that 100 hertz, and uh, we can also find the sum of motif one and sum motif two, and then the, like uh, there are more examples to motif, and uh, this motif will be used, and the uh, motif will be discovered, and uh, they will be useful to analyze the data set that we are analyzing. Right, so here we are interested in finding temporal motif trained in the deep temporal neural network. That is what we are interested in. 
So like, uh, let's see some of the like uh, easy model, like uh, of course, actually recently there are many like advanced in the time series data analysis, like especially with partial temporal, like a neural network and so on. But in this like um, uh, case, we are trying to find uh, like a simple model and see how this simple model works. So, so like uh, these are the model that people use in the multi-layer perceptron or FCM, fully convolutional neural network and ResNet. And uh, like uh, we see that the full, like a fully convolutional neural network is like a uh, similar to like uh, what we have seen in the like a uh, previous slide, but. In here, so fully convolutional mean is so you all the individual channel, so all the input in the previous channel will be used to make all the input in the next channel, right? So, and so on. So, like uh, in the you see our data set, then we can we observe that like FCM fully convolutional network like uh, show the good performance in many cases then compared to the existing model, right? And, right, so FCN is good. And also like uh, if you see the recent advance and the ResNet is like uh, also good, like uh, meaning that, so ResNet is an operation. So when X is calm and we have like, a, oh, sorry. So ResNet is an operation. So when we have X and in the next layer, so we have a weighted layer, typically convolution operation and the ReLU nonlinear clash by nonlinear activation function and the weighted layer and plus with original X. So instead of like a next layer is Y is F X, and we represent that as next layer is F X. Plus X, right? So we actually like represent it as all this unit as H in the layer L. Then this is what ResNet do. So we have representation of nonlinear convolution, uh, convo, convo, uh, conversion of the input plus input, right? So that is, that is what ResNet do. And uh, actually this ResNet like uh, can be applicable several times, right? So what like we are saying is, so we have convolution operation. So we took that as H, convolution operation and the nonlinear operator and the H or F and so on. So we apply these ones. And so this is the result applying this one. And uh, we also use original one, XL minus one. And this is H L X L minus one. And if we can use convolution twice, one and two, right? Once and two. And we can apply convolution one, two, three. So the, we can apply, so we can use eight, same HL because we apply same convolution several times, recursively, uh, recurrently like one. So that is called a recurrent convolution layer. So we apply the same convolution and apply convolution again and again. So if we remember, like if we remind the tail decomposition, if the like a convolution operation is close to the uh, differentiate of the original function, then the, this will like resemble the tail of like a decomposition, first order and second order and third order. So like uh, this simple network, uh, like work really well in the uh, uh, easy classification task. So recurrent convolution neural network. So that is actually like a uh, 
uh, applied to the uh, classification of EEG signal. So EEG signal is measured in the millisecond wise. And then the, like uh, these people, this like a uh, person try to go to this like object and try to grip and uh, up and down. So these measurement and the sensor and the EEG signal is measured by the hand start and the first digit touch and lift off and replace and the both release. So this is actually how the signal looks like. And that was held in the 2015 in the Kaggle competition and grasp and lift EEG detection. And this is a long time ago, but as we say that this is a simple model. So like uh, the one simple model that win the competition is the Ang Sangbu model. Like uh, the, the winner was Ang Sangbu model was 36 like combination of 36 time series deep neural network model. And the second one, like a win the competition, like a second like a ranked model is this recurrent neural like, like convolutional layer. So which has like a typical um, uh, temporal neural network with the recurrent layer. So the difference is actually the recurrent layer has three traits and meaning that so it has like a three the up to three order of um, the convolutional operation is uh, applied. So at the beginning, it has about three seconds of, like 3.5 seconds of signal, right? Because one millimeter signal long. And uh, so you have 3584 3, uh, time point so that it has convolutional layer. And uh, the individual filter size is one of nine. And we have 256 of this individual filter. And then we have a pool size and the size four and the size is reduced by four, divided by four, right? And this is fully convolutional. So then we have from 256 and the 256 and then also size is reduced by four and uh, 256 and the 256. So then the size is reduced, right? And the uh, individual 100, uh, one, that one by nine filter will be like uh, slided by one in the convolutional layer with the 256, 256 layer. And so what I'm saying is, in the in the internal layer, so this is nine and two hundred fifty six channel, and we have so this like a long input will go into the one value here, so after we sliding into one time point, this will fill the next value in the channel. So we have also 256, right? So like uh, what we actually try to see is, so we try to analyze, so this is actually one of the good model at the time. So of course, actually like uh, now we have a better other model. So this is one of the better model, like which beat the LSTM and also RNN, also other FCN and so on. So this is actually good to analyze. So we try to analyze the filter. So like uh, this is a forward method and uh, we try to analyze uh, the first layer filter. So we can, it's a little bit hard to see, but now we try to see the internal, like uh, how internal input are changed. So like as we discussed, the internal, like uh, original input has 32 channel of input in easy signal. So we try to capture and how individual input are like a map in the individual layer. So, so this is actually 256 uh, input that fuse into the first layer. And 256 input in the second layer. And uh, like other layer, third layer, fourth layer, and so on. So in the original input from the, this hand start, 
after the convolutional layer is mapped and the individual input in the individual channel is measured and reduced in size so we can see from the beginning to the end. So this is about 350, 3500 then the length, and then the, we make the individual channel the values, then the, we track how this is changed. First layer and second layer, and the third layer and fourth layer. And the fifth layer and the sixth layer. So what we can see is, so like uh, the value is more quantified, right? And now at the finer, so we can see that most of value, which is low, high, and so on, quantified. So like uh, at the beginning, we have some value, which is uh, the resemble the original pattern. Then after we uh, like plug in into the RCL model, so we can see that the pattern is where quantify either zero and one and so on. So meaning that so it will become the more linear pattern. And if we see plug in the first digit touch, and this is also similar. So in the first layer and the second layer, so then the original like a spiky pattern is maintained and third layer, fourth layer. So you can see that the pattern is, spiky pattern is like a little bit uh, diminishing and uh, changing a little bit. And now we can find some of the value is going on top. And now in the final layer that is also changed into the zero value or the bigger value and so on, right? So like a quantify, so even if we have a different pattern, so if we have a replace, then the first layer, second layer, and third, fourth, and now like a fifth layer, sixth layer. So we can see that those like a signal are were changed and quantified like as in the other like the example and so on. So we can see that. So this actually like a temporal pattern is well quantified and uh, so on. So the thing is actually that does not solve our original question, like uh, how we can, uh, uh, like uh, how the individual motif in the deep temporal neural network are formed. So what we actually recent do, recently do in our researcher and in our lab is, so we can try to find trained deep neural network first, temporal deep neural network first, and then let's try to apply LRP algorithm and let's try to make like a uh, similar one in the network dissection in the time series data. So how we can separate so the time series data into semi-global representative part without handcraft segmentation label. So of course, actually like uh, in the, like uh, we discuss uh, uh, in the text, like uh, previously, then the like a uh, asymmetric like a uh, network dissection and again dissection require the semantic segmentation model which requires semantic segmentation label. So in many time series data set, the, of course actually there are a lot of work in the motif, but carefully designed the semantic segmentation label does not like uh, uh, exist. So then what we can do is we can train the time series data and uh, using the LRP signal and the cluster those pattern and the visualize. So then the, we may see what's trained inside in the deep temporal neural network. So we actually named those models as a cluster pattern of highly activated period. So actually the idea is really simple. So if we have convolutional neural network, so we use convolutional neural network because RCL and other fully convolutional neural network are performed in some task, then of course actually WaveNet is also used with the convolutional one, then the RNN or LSTM. So like uh, we use convolution, temporal convolution neural network, and uh, we try to see like uh, which individual layer, node in the layer are like activated by specific input. So what we are doing is, 
So for individual node in the temper like a um, uh, neural network, so we analyze individual input part which activated this node and uh, like cluster like a uh, correct those like collect those nodes and the cluster based on the some clustering algorithm and uh, we visualize when new example come and uh, we use the LRP algorithm to propagate for the input to the activated pattern and we visualize those into the clustered one. So what we are doing is, so for the specific node one in the layer, so we cluster individual pattern which like, um, uh, like activated this clustering label and like this specific node and the one individual node come and we find which is closest to one and visualize. The reason why we make several cluster is, so even if actually the, especially in the higher layer, so if we have one node, so there are a lot of different input pattern which will activate the specific node. So you can see that so in the image case, there are a lot of different shape of eyes. Then there are a lot of different shape of bird, right? If we select a bird node, and this bird node will differ based on the shape. So time series data too. And uh, if we have uh, one activation in the time series data, it like, uh, may have different patterns so that like, uh, we will try to capture different pattern, which is classified into the single um, activated pattern in the node, and uh, we have different cluster. So, and also if we have the higher layer, because of the pulling in the spatial layer, the length is longer. So if we see that, so the length for the first layer is shorter and the length for the second layer, it depends on the pulling. And uh, like we can also the uh, cluster those pattern which highlighted a uh, specific unit and also like uh, we uh, cluster the pattern which is highlighted in the third layer and so on, right? So then you can see that the length for the third layer is longer and the second one, right? And the first one and so on. So yeah, so then like uh, this is what uh, I explained. Uh, so the clustering pattern and also we demonstrate with the highlighted like uh, LRP and also we like uh, use the mean of the activated pattern and the variance of the activated pattern that we got from the clustering, right? So given one node sample is, one node highlighted activated pattern is uh, the selected. So based on this input, we are finding the closest uh, cluster and we demonstrate the mean and variance of the cluster together with original data. So that is actually a simple idea. So like an input sequence and highly, highly activated period for specific node and we apply like clustered pattern and also with uncertainty. So cluster pattern is mean. And this is a mean and variance. Right. So in a way that, so we can see that how individual input, like uh, even though like uh, a specific input activated a specific channel, so this is the pattern which highlighted, activate, like uh, activated the channel 18. And you can see that, so like uh, the pattern 18, like uh, this input, is like almost perfectly matched well, but you can see that, so those part in the middle, even though it activated, so that it does not like activate some of in the middle part and the other part and so on. So if you go on, so the, in the layer two, and this is channel 36, which is activated, but you can see that, 
So even if actually there is unmatched part in terms of the mean, so then we can see that like uh, this part is well matched. This part is like a less matched in terms of this actually like uh, in the clustered pattern. And also we can see that, so of course the like uh, overall shape are well matched in the channel 56 and in terms of mean value, so there are some part which is less matched. Right. So you can think actually this way. So we find the template. So suppose that this is classified as a face. Then, so we find the template of face which is close to a uh, individual uh, person. And uh, like uh, some cases, the uh, face is stereotype. In some cases, actually the face is uh, detected, but this is not like stereotype. So when this type of like a uh, face is detected, then the, probably the face may not be actually true face. And that is actually our hypothesis. So in a way that we can visually identify, so like this part is relatively well matched, even though there are some gaps. And uh, like uh, we can say that the spike part is less matched and so on. So we can actually like a visually individual channel and uh, in terms of mean value and the variance value, and uh, because of we cluster the individual pattern, then we can see how like uh, activated one in the internal unit will match to the input. Yeah. So this is a layer one, and this is a layer three, and so on. So you can also see that so like a uh, layer three uh, has a longer sequence than the layer one and two. So we apply this to the several data set in the like a uh, ResNet. So this is actually the one with like a uh, layer nine and uh, also layer nine. But if you have different um, uh, data set, which is a smooth case and the rapidly changing case, and we can see that so sometime actually like uh, this neural network well matched and the uh, rapidly matching case and the smooth case differently. So we can also see that, so like uh, this trend is match the, without matching the specific up and down, right? Because original trend is going up, right? So of course, sometime, so previously these up and down pattern are matched in the channel 26 and layer five and the layer seven, six channel seven is well matched. But if you can see the layer, layer seven and the channel seven, this is less matched. Of course, actually like a, we sample this channel. So different channel match different signals. So probably this like peak will be matched in the other channel, but we can visually see individual channel, then the activated channel, then how which channel is well matched, which channel is less matched and so on. So then like if you use different filter size and uh, of course actually this different filter and uh, like this is a longer filter and this is shorter filter and uh, we can see the different aspect and different motif actually like a uh, train in the individual pattern. So like one key difference like uh, using just uh, generating like a sample for here is so uh, we are trying to cluster the image as we discussed before then the original input data it will be distorted as we discussed in the previous section right then in the um, uh, original space it may not have a single motif it may have a multiple motif right so we may have a better like um, so we use uh, like a clustering or clustering or we like a uh, compared with several clustering algorithms, SOM and the K means clustering and the uh, uh, maximum mean discrepancy and so on. So, different clustering algorithms give us a similar result. And then, our idea is like uh, this highly activated pattern in the higher layer may require different clustering which wish to have a similar algorithm, a similar like a uh, model. So like, so you can see that, uh, so like uh, this um, uh, channel 15 and the channel 19 and the, like a test, like a different test set and different channel. So we can see that this is well matched case. 
and as we discussed, this, there are some case which is less matched, like a less matched case. And so on. And also we can visually comparing so this method with uh, uh, like uh, the LRP method, existing XAI method. And then this is actually upsampled feature map. So which feature are like a highly important in the last layer of the linear mapping. And also this is upsampled feature map. So if we only upsample for the highly important feature, that is what we will get. And this is a unit LRP. If we apply LRP in the unit, so which highly activated one, so this will be we will get. And this is actually our clustered pattern, right? And so on. One of the distinctions between LRP and uh, our method is, so LRP does not form a mo continuous motif because it will just get a simple point. So there are a lot of missing points here, right? But like in here, we use continuous like a value in a way that we we'll get the continuous output. So that we can take the like a uh, pattern with the motif, and if we put up the those like uh, in a like a uh, less important area, so that is better than LRP one. So that is actually one of the output. So like uh, I will try the this is what we discuss about like interpreting deep neural network in the time series data model. So. In the like a remaining session, a remaining uh, time, I try to uh, briefly overview the, some of the Bayesian method which explain time series data. So, like like so, uh, like as we discussed at the beginning. So like uh, there are a lot of job automation is done in the finance and the in insurance and the military and so on. So, for example, in the finance, there are a lot of actually like a. Uh, uh, data processing and the data collection currently like 40, 14% and 20% of all the job will be automated in the future. 67% and 50% will be automated. And this is the report generated by automated insight, right? So there'll be this bit street, uh, three quarter like a forecast and the Adobe system and like report this one is generating by the automated insight, like data collect from the Jack investment. And, and also like a narrative science generating the automated narration for the game. So Sonoma County Little League, Anthony T got it done on the bump on the way to win. So he allowed two runs over two and third inning and struck out four and so on. So this is automated generated, right? And this automated generated system and the uh, past Turing test, actually the, when the uh, this is generated by software, 10 of this is like judged by the written by journalists. When the journalists write the article, and the uh, 10 of 18 is judged by written by software and so on, right? But like also industrial like a uh, success is huge. And but you can see that so this type of like a uh, method is done by the template. So so if you see the like a uh, uh, right part and the dudes the like a uh, the bold face actually the uh, our bold color, our the, the like a um, uh, blue color, and uh, like uh, will be the template. Even though like gray one is the like a uh, field one, and this is the same. So the template. So like what we may need to do is, uh, so we try to get the context in the deep neural network, but the deep neural network case is less semantic. So meaning that we find the motif and the cluster based on the activation of pattern which maximize the classification output. But the those context is a little bit less like um, uh, 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 
like explicit to find the meaning. So let's try to find the meaning. So not generating copy, but finding the meaning inside. So there will be the another actually like a goal of our uh, like a analysis. So like let's try to find the context in the time series data with the Bayesian method. So our goal in here is descriptive prediction of time series data. And we also wish to have a prediction in the next time step. And uh, we used to have a description. So for example, we have a linear function and we have a smooth function and we have a rapidly varying smooth function. So we can say that from this time series data, we have a linear pattern and we have a smooth pattern, right? And we have a residual pattern, right? So we used to find this and explain with this patternizer. So we can use this, we can uh, do this stuff with the Gaussian process. So like if we have function f and the Gaussian process and mean and the corner like a k and what we can define is, so the Gaussian process define it like for endpoint, we can evaluate uh, individual endpoint by, so whenever we choose endpoint, and those two endpoints will have multivariate Gaussian with the mean mu and the covariance function, sigma, right? So like this is actually the example for the Gaussian process. If we have a one, two, three, four, five, then the, we can compute the covariance of the, these value, these value based on the like a uh, difference of input or the input itself. So like, uh, so typically our assumption is when the value is far from, two, two value are far from, those covariance they are decreasing, right? And when those values are closed in the input, then the, those variance will be big. So suppose that we are changing the value in here up and down much. If there is strong covariance correlation between these nodes, right? If we take up and down, and this value will be up or down, right? But if we have like small covariance, even if we change this up and down, this will change a little. If the covariance is zero, it will not change, right? So that is the basic for the Gaussian process. We have covariance between the random variable and those covariance can be modeled or learned or computed from the difference between the input. So like a Gaussian process may have different covariance and this covariance may represent different like a, a model. So like a linear model, if you have this type of corner, meaning that when those difference is bigger and the variance is bigger, change linearly. And the skewed exponential, so if the value bigger and then the, like a, if, it is close, then the covariance is big. And if it is far from the covariance, it's actually uh, decrease uh, exponentially. And the periodic function is, so for if we actually like uh, going far and with some period, the value will have higher um, the covariance. So if we have smooth function, we can represent this smooth time series. And if we have a periodic pattern and the periodic corner, and we can represent this periodicity in the time series. And we can also uh, like a usual linear to represent linear model. So yeah, so this, yeah, so this is actually like uh, our goal in this Gaussian process. Uh, so we wish to like, uh, learn the Gaussian process, which is composed of several corners. So this is actually done, like this is called the automatic statistician, which is uh, done by Jubin Garamani's group and the Josh Tenema's group in MIT and Cambridge. 
And uh, what we can do is, what they show is, so if we have two Gaussian process, and G, and H, and which is incurred from the corner K, and corner H, when these hyperparameters are independent for the corner G, like a uh, corner G and the corner K, right? Corner KG and KH, when we sum of these, and also the, they are zero mean, and the summation of this corner, uh, like Gaussian process, can be represented by Gaussian process is summation of those corner, and the multiplication of this corner can be represented by Gaussian process with multiplication with this corner. Right. So this is not trivial. So like uh, we generate Gaussian process, we generate Gaussian process, and the sum is uh, what we are generating new Gaussian process and the summing the corner. And we multiplying these two Gaussian process is what we are generating two Gaussian process with multiplying this corner. Right. So that is actually what we can do. So because this is exact, what our goal is from the training data, so we can try to make a multiplication and the summation, try to decompose uh, several Gaussian process to represent like a more complex uh, time series data. So in a way that, so if we sum the square exponential and the periodic part, and we can have a little bit periodic but smooth function with noise, and if we sum the linear plus periodic one, then we can represent linear but with a periodic silicon. And if we like a secure exponential and the periodic one, and we can also a little bit spiky but periodic like form is generated. So like a so this is actually a generation model. So we have node one, like periodic one, periodic city and the uh, summation of this and we will get this data and in the learning procedure so we have data and uh, we compute the empirical covariance matrix from the data with the uh, finite size of window by sliding those window and decompose that into the corner that we have formed which is explainable right so of course actually the sum is like a corner which is not explainable but our goal is try to find the explainable corner first and decompose and the remaining corner with unexplainable one with unexplainable corner function. So like uh, this uh, process is done by grid corner search uh, in the uh, Romer statistician. So with the Bayesian information criteria. So then whenever we have a model, then the, we try to compute the negative log likelihood that we used to minimize and we used to more minimize the model complexity by limiting the number of model parameters. So whenever we sum or we multiply multiple corner and this corner will have a higher, like a bigger, like a complex model, then this complex model fit the data better, right? And we'll have a higher negative log likelihood. But with the BIC measure, so if, even if we add additional corner, and this increased complexity, and but it, this does not come with actually the uh, better, like improved log likelihood, and we stop the procedure. So those procedure is expansion without like a no structure, square exponential, linear, periodicity, and then expansion with linear plus periodic, and the multiply with the square exponential and so on. And when this part of one is selected as best and uh, improve further. So this is greedy procedure, which is not uh, finding the optimal one, but finding the optimal in the uh, one expansion and they expand more in the next layer and so on. So if we doing this, then the original sequence is uh, decomposed into the linear function and the like smooth function and the rapidly varying function and so on. So we can explain that into the text. So if we have uh, the like sunspot, sunspot and uh, this can be represented by the like um, summarized sage 
and between 1650 to the 1700 and the periodicity in the every 100 year and the periodic pattern of sunspot change in 11 years are like uh, exactly computed and reported. So this is actually like a bit many actually Gaussian process based uh, prediction method for smooth time series data and the extrapolation performance dropped significantly, right? And that is actually like uh, the benefit of automatic statistician which explain uh, the like uh, qualitative analysis and also improve the performance because of kernel composition, automatic kernel composition. So, but still there is a challenge and uh, one challenge is so like uh, uh, in many cases when 911 attack data come and this is the stock of G price and GG and then so like we know that there is a sudden drop because of like a 911 of course actually coronavirus COVID case and um, many of, of stock price goes down and went down and uh, like when go up again, right? But we know that, but like if you apply this, then the, this data is stopped as a noisy signal, right? Because it's just one signal, so we don't have, if we just see the G stop, then there is no um, evidence that this is actually the outcome from the like global event. So no description on the 911. So like uh, what we actually can do is we can analyze multiple time series data and the General Electronics and the Microsoft ExxonMobil and explore multiple one and finding global description and probably this will have a better prediction. So we typically see this as global model and uh, we try to make a uh, parameter sharing over this uh, multiple time series data is what we wish to do. So our goal is try to find multiple time series data. We used to have similar like descriptive model, but in the 911 event, like a Corona beat event, and we used to find the common pattern and uh, explain those common pattern well. So this is done by actually like uh, those uh, like uh, model expansion and uh, model uh, uh, variation in the GP. So in the automatic statistician, so Gaussian process is run by kernel grammar. And this kernel grammar will uh, find several function. These several function will uh, generate several different observation and so on. So we call that as generalized multi corner learning. And uh, like uh, what, we, uh, what we try to do is we try to find the shared corner over the multiple time series data. So if we have time series data from one to M and we wish to have corner, which will share the parameter in a way that so we have uh, GP is uh, um, generated with shared corner with uh, different data, but we we'll try to also, this is shared corner, shared part. Parameter. And this is individual corner. So like parameter sharing corner and the individual corner. So these are individual corner. And this is a shared corner. So we combine these two. So then the shared corner, individual corner is non-explainable because we use spectral mixture. And uh, like uh, the, um, uh, the like shared corner is explainable and explaining all the time series. So, so you can see the headline of this paper is generated by the shared corner. So if you apply that to the several financial data that we gather, so like uh, uh, 
nine adjacent close of stock figure, which is top nine uh, stock in around nine one one, and the uh, U.S. housing price, and also like uh, emerging market currency exchange, and uh, if you apply this, and the automatic statistician couldn't find those common pattern, but uh, our method relational automatic statistician find the common pattern and explain. So you have stock market value suddenly drop after 911 attack. Of course, 911 attack is not like a given. So after 911, like uh, September 11. And also current exchange is affected by FED policy change in the interest rate. So when FED policy change interest rate and uh, those like um, currency exchange rate for southern market drop. And we could find those drops, common find, common drop. So also compared to the automatic statistician, so these parameter sharing technique like uh, reduce the error a lot. Like of course, because so we can have a global event and the uh, global event may improve like uh, uh, help to improve the performance, predictive performance. Yeah, so that is like uh, in terms of base, base and information criteria, or so on the root to mean square. So uh, the new uh, like corner with global information and the local information will reduce the root to mean square a lot. Yeah, so Makoto, so like, uh, so we have provided reference for the, uh, the, our work in the, like that is in the archive. So then I will uh, share it the end of the slide. Yeah, so if we apply, so if you apply that uh, model into uh, the, like, uh, uh, like uh, model. So then, so at the beginning, so we have original data. So the first component we find is constant, right? And after constant, the residual is zero centered, right? And the zero centered, and the there is actually like a sum of component of so far. And then, so this is actually the residual. And uh, so at the second component, is pro proposed as this, right? And the the residual after second component is come because second component is look like this, and uh, like a residual is main maintained with reduced amount of magnitude, and this is summation of first component and the second component, and the third component is proposed. Right, and the residual is maintained, and the summation of first and second and third is like presented here, and the last component is mapped by the like a sixth component, the last component, and the summation of like a component it will like compose the original sequence. So like um. Yeah, I omit the first and fifth component, and uh, this is a procedure how the residual is fit by this uh, uh, automatic composition of uh, kernel function. Yeah, so this is final result and the generated output. Yeah, so this is a report automatically generated and also like predicts with the GP and so on. So like a, a one extension that we can make is, so like a, we may also say, you may also think that, so one global shared corner may be not good enough idea because sometimes we see have a, a lot of training data or a lot of different time series data, then some of the data may have like similar pattern, but some of the data may not have a similar pattern. So in a way that if you have all the stock in your stock market, and the, some like a uh, stock may like work similarly based on the sector like Amazon and uh, Google and Facebook Google, like uh, may like work similarly but Apple may like uh, work differently. So 
so on. So what we can do is we can use this Gaussian process kernel composition by selectively finding like kernel, like a, and the time series. Suppose that we have three time series data and only one time series data has a periodic pattern, then so we can learn the periodic pattern, but only one time series data is selected for this periodic pattern. But like these three, like time series data share the smooth going up uh, pattern. And the second one is not selected linear one, and the two is selected one for the smaller one, and so on. So we used to have mem run the membership with IVP. So by doing the same, like a global relational kernel learning. So if you actually like are doing this and we can also learn that, so the like out of South Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russian currency, and we can select some of the sequence and these actually like a full sequence share this smooth function with typical length of 6.4 day. And this is until this one from 70 onward, like so from so this actually like uh, the components apply from a specific day to a specific day by finding the temporal like position and also the Indonesian, Malaysian, Russian will have a linear pattern but South African does not follow this linear pattern. And so if you see that the South African is a little bit like big drop jump in here, so it may not fit into the linear pattern very well, right? So this is possible. So then we can discover the uh, like a latent covariance structure. Well, and uh, even if we have same corner, we may have different uh, instantiation. So then we can have a shared component and the individual component, the individual component does not share for the gold price, price and oil price, price. And, but this, even if they share the same corner component, they share the corner parameter, but the, their like uh, actual pattern is not the same. So even if actually they share the corner parameter itself, their shape may not um, same. So as you see in the gold and oil case, so there is actually also the improvement like uh, compared to the previous time model. So if we actually learn this IBP model with the global like a corner like a model, then the, we can in the time series data and also the age data, then the, we can demonstrate the new algorithm work better. So new algorithm is represented in here. And this uh, R A B C D is the relational automatic statistician, and this is actually the new I B P model, and we can show that this model is clearly better than the existing method in several data sets. So, like this is a final couple of slides that I wish to share. So, like this is what. What I'm happy said. I read the annual report of the company I'm looking at. I read the annual report of the competitor that is a main source of material. And so that is actually like what Warren Buffett tried to get a uh, prediction. So like uh, uh, one of the uh, my motivation to see the explainable AI is so when we apply those predictive time series model and how we can analyze uh, to understand the how individual uh, Bayesian based or machine learning based uh, prediction or deep neural network based prediction work and uh, which motif or which temporal pattern is uh, concentrated on and uh, how this prediction will be changed based on the different sensitivity, ana sensitivity analysis. So like in my research lab, so the, we are trying to find this Bayesian method and deep neural network base. And also we are also analyzing the uh, annual report, not only for the time series data, but also finding the other external factors that apply to the 
time series data. So we may have a better predictive analysis, but also make the generation of the explanation. So there is a conclusion for the third section. So like automated data collection and the processing will really change our daily life and that I believe. And automated this narrative generation method may have like a widespread application. And the composition of explainable methods would generate more human understandable description data with the deep neural network explanation. And uh, like uh, even though we didn't go through this by right, reading and explaining like this also will be helpful. Yeah, so this is a reference that I say and uh, this is the, uh, what we are working on. So CPHAP, so like uh, it's the paper that we shared in the archive. So this is end of my tutorial uh, presentation. So thanks for joining. <laughs> And um, also, ah, I'm not so sure you know my email, so I will try to write my email here. Yeah, so please send me an email. Also, you can ask any question. So I will try to be, I will be available to answer any question that you have in the uh, material that I prepared. Thanks everyone.